Um, what was wonderful was that I was um, contacted by Deborah. Um, and first of all, I had no idea that B&H had a lecture series, which I thought was pretty fantastic, considering that this is the epicenter for a lot of photography. So um, because I'm going to have a book signing tomorrow at ICP, I said yes, that I would come. So that's why I'm here. Um, what, I'll, what I wanted to do is I have a PowerPoint presentation with a little bit of history of photography and, and particularly circus. And then I wanted to show you some of the images and talk about them. And then I always feel that these lectures are more about what you can get out of it. So I really want you to ask me, you know, everything's on the table. Any questions you may have about um, how I shoot. But as just, just briefly, I still photograph with film. I shoot with a Hasselblad. I shoot available light. I don't use flash. I don't use a tripod. Um, and I um, basically consider myself a photographer that sees without a camera. So I try to go there and make an observation. And so, uh, and then from there I start to shoot. And remember, I either have 12 or I have 24, um, you know, ways of looking at what I just shot after I process it. I still process, I still use dark room. My prints are still done, done in, um, in the dark room. And um, so it's pretty old school, it's pretty magical, and it's pretty slow, which is why I think we wanted to call this slow photography, to take it down. The other thing was that um, I didn't intend to photograph the circus. It just happened. It was pretty magical and I had no idea that I was going to spend 10 years photographing the circus. And this particular circus is one circus. So it's not like I went to many, many circuses. It's one circus. It's an American circus. And I say American, even though it's actually the ultimate you know, melting pot, is that the circus, any circus actually for that matter, is usually a combination of people that are hired by the company. And in this case, it was a gentleman by the name of James, who um, from Hugo, Oklahoma. And Hugo, Oklahoma actually is a circus city. I don't know if you knew that. And so it was from there that he built the company, and then he took it on the road. And I met him when he started the circus, and, and I ended the project when he ended the circus. And he ended the circus primarily because of immigration issues. But so that's why it's an American one ring circus. Sometimes you'll see circuses and they may be um, obviously Cirque du Soleil or they're uh, particularly certain markets. So what I'll do now is I'm going to um, talk a little bit about circus, but I wanted to give you that as a background that it's an American one ring circus as opposed to two rings. So this is the cover of the book, and we'll talk a little bit about the process of the book. Um, but the idea was to do a cover that was also a poster. So it's a poster within this having this art book. And again, we'll talk a little bit about that because it was, it was very, it was fascinating. So when I'm essentially a self-taught photographer. So I have a master's in sociology um, from Ohio. I'm a Midwest girl. And um, never thought of myself as an artist, ever. Um, but it was interesting because, you know, anywhere I would go, everybody would say, well, what kind of art do you do? And I thought, well, I'm not an artist. And I'd go to an opening and they'd go, oh, you're, you know, your paintings are beautiful. And I'm like, oh, I'm not the painter. So I had this identity as this artist. And so when I started to tap into that after I, you know, um, in very late in my life, um, I really thought that what I really loved was photography. So I pretty much learned the craft of photography. I didn't get a degree in photography, but I learned the craft. I took workshops. And then I started to launch into this uh, world. And so what I wanted to show you was kind of um, Bruce Davidson, who's, you know, probably a lot of you know, 
um, has photographed circuses. And this is, um, I wouldn't say, well, maybe it was typical of that time where they wanted to, you to get a sense of circus, that it was wet and there was something very somber about it. The other was, um, there are many, many, many photographs out there of, of uh, circus, but you know, remember this is, t I want you to take this in, the, in its time, which is um, maybe the 40s, so that it used to be, and actually there is still circuses out there in, in a, a variation of that, where they would take people that were not seen um, as quote unquote average. And so they would parade people who looked differently. And this was just, you know, one of the images that you would see. Again, it's, um, th they were um, photographs of people maybe who were um, now, of course, uh, you know, politically correct. They're little people. But um, they would, you know, you would often see photographs of people. Um, it almost looks like an iPad or something for me, but yeah. like, uh, but you know, of being um, photographed in the back and that sort of thing. And this is Mary Ellen Mark. Um, how many of you know Mary Ellen Mark's work? So you know her work. So um, Mary Ellen is one is somebody that uh, when I wanted to learn the craft of photography. I took a workshop from her. And one of the reasons I took a workshop because I've always loved her work of circuses. And, um, and so, I, so this is the work in Mexico. I think she did also a body of work on um, circuses in India. But this was particularly in, um, in, in Mexico. And again, um, different. Um, I know she lights her work. Um, and so I just wanted to show you what's been out there. And that's the sort of thing that I would see a lot of um, uh, imagery like this, I should say. This was also Mary Ellen Mark. And this is actually, I think, on the cover of one of her books and uh, of the Indian, of an Indian circus. And, um, and you'll see how I, I did a version of it which, uh, of, of um, somebody who's also a contortionist. And August Saunders is a photographer that I just adore. I mean, um, you probably know of his work where he photographed, um, you know, people in his community and um, and again, I just, it's just divine, this image to me, it's divine with her costume and um, where she's, you know, when I certainly know that he shot this with film. And then this is Deanne Arbus. And of course, Deanne Arbus, a New Yorker, famous, wonderful, um, did, she was pretty much one of the, the people that, um, that kind of set the, you know, who, you know, started to do um, what they would call freaks. But and again, there are people who were not seen by everyday people. She was actually a fashion photographer. And, um, and so I just think this, this is one of the images that I responded to. So again, I um, loved her work. And this is Graciela Iturbide. Um, she, if you don't know her work, you should look at it. She's actually from Mexico, Mexico City. And I um, took a workshop from her. Um, and she was probably, she's one of my biggest mentors because when I'm rushing around trying to do work, as a lot of people do work, um, she told me that she, she used to work for Manuel Bravo, who, um, of course, he happened to live to be 100, but he said to her, um, as she's running around, um, she's, he would say, hay tiempo, a y tiempo, which means there is time. Because um, like her, I, I've had, you know, um, times with her and lunch with her. And I said, oh, Graciela, she was just at the Tate. Tell me about your journey. And she always said to me, just, there's just time. I mean, just do the work and it'll happen for you. So it, she's just an, an incredible 
um, kind of quiet soul. So anyway, this is Graciela Iturbide, and this is the work that she did in Oaxaca, Mexico. Okay, how it all began. Um, it, I call it my breakdown breakthrough, because I found myself having studied photography, um, photographing everything and anything, and, this, and trying to figure out what, what was my next step. I live in Napa, Napa Valley. Does, do any of you, have you ever been to Napa? Napa Valley, California. And I had just moved there from San Francisco, and I was working in, a, in, a, in, corporate, uh, in the corporate world, and I had my two young kids, and, and I found myself wondering, well, I know I wasn't going to get and start traveling the world and start to photograph. And so I was having one of those moments. I was, I was at a cafe, and I see this ticket. This is a copy of the ticket. And, you know, I see Vacaville, and these are all places near me, near my house. And so it was the ticket to a circus. And so I thought, all right. And I re had remembered what Sally Mann had said, because somebody had asked her, so why did you photograph your kids in the back of your house? I mean, in, you know, your children. And she said, because they were, they were in the back of my house. I mean, it's as simple as that. And so I just remember thinking that I didn't really have to travel the world. I think a lot of times people are always going so far away to photograph when it's really in front of you. Uh, it can be, I should say, in front of you. And so when I decided to, um, I, so I decided, well, I'm just going to go to the circus, thinking I was just going to go and maybe take a couple of shots. That was my intent. Little that I know that it was going to take me on a 10-year journey. I think if I would have thought that, I would not have gone, because that's pretty scary. So one of the things that I have always learned and I would recommend is that you need to always ask people, always ask them if you can take their photo. Now, you can get two answers, yes or no. But I thought, OK, I'm going to have to ask. And so I went to their trailer, and I went to the person in the front, and who was the owner, and he said, you know, I don't have any problem with it, but you're going to have to ask these people if that's okay with them. And so he said, I would start with the trapeze family, because in the circus world, and Deborah, you would know, um, is that in the circus world, kind of the trapeze of the circus is the act. That's what everybody waits for. It's always at the end. There's always a suspense. And so they were the first people that I needed to speak with. So when I spoke to them, um, of course, they said, oh, sure. What paper do you work for? And I said, no, I'm not with a paper. And they said, well, so is this going to be in a magazine? And I said, no, this is not going to be in a magazine. This is from, this is, I'm just photographing. So they, they kind of knew their experience with photographers is that the papers, the newspapers, the magazines come by and they start taking pictures. And so when I said, no, I'm just doing the photographs, and I shoot in black, black and white, and they said, ah, black and white. They almost knew then for them and for me that that's what, they understood that. And it turns out that when I started to talk to them, they would show me photographs of their families, and they were in black and white. And so um, I started to photograph them, and I religiously... Um, got all of their um, signatures. I highly recommend that. And because it was um, lots of nationalities, I had the form, the model release form, done in um, Russian, in Mandarin, in Spanish, and of course English. Because I, I just, I thought, well, if I ever do a book, which I wasn't necessarily planning, I thought, it's just a great habit. Just have them, just cut and paste. There's no right and wrong uh, model release. Just get a model release and have them signed. Because I also think that it sets you up for, they understand that you're doing this and you may use their image. So when I spoke to them, um, they said, um, sure. And so they did what they always do, which is they started to pose. And so as we all know from photography, that's for them. That's not the image for you. 
So my first challenge was to photograph people who are accustomed to being photographed. So that was, that was very interesting because I had to get them to just not pose. So that was my first um, experience. So I took all day and I photographed them. And then they were going to be there another day. So I said, I'll come back. And I came back. And I came back. At that point, my family thought I had lost my mind because they had never seen me so, um, so excited about anything. About, and they really thought, particularly my husband, he thought I was going to run away with them. <laughs> Literally, he just thought, okay, you have lost your mind. And so, um, but I would come home. So that's the thing I wanted you to understand is that I would photograph them, but then I would come home. So because I do during the day, I would get there in the morning, and then I would come home in the afternoon. And the nice thing about summer is the light is out, so and much longer. So I started to photograph them and thought, okay, they're here for five days, for five days. And then they would say, ah, so we're going to go to Vacaville. Well, Vacaville is only not even an hour away. So I wanted you to know that, that that's how it started. Okay, so this is, this is one of the first photographs that I took. Um, and his name is Alex. And one of the things that, um, that is really interesting is that in, within the circus family, there's usually a star. There's usually somebody who um, becomes the one, the one that that excels. I mean, they're all talented, but they all can't do the same thing. And Alex comes from a family of acrobats and jugglers. So this is Alex. So people have asked, well, someone like Alex, does he, what's his goal? Does he want to go, for example, with Cirque du Soleil? And the answer is no. That they, this particular, the people that I photographed come from generations of circus, and they stay together. And their goal isn't to leave the family, because then, because it would totally affect the family. It's to stay with the family. So Alex was like the prima donna. He was the one, because he could juggle. He won. He would go to Monte Carlo. He's traveled around the world, but he always comes home. So this is Alex. So this one. Um, it was an interesting story because this is a very typical uh, way that I photograph. I was just in the back. They call it the back of the house. I don't photograph in front of the house. I didn't photograph them performing, but I just was hanging out with them. And so one of the things is uh, this particular uh, performer, his name is Romeo. And so they would all be kind of telling me particularly their stories. And one of the things is they said, well, Romeo can stand on his head. And I thought, well, you all can, right? And they're like, oh, no, no. He can stand anywhere on his head. And I said, well, what do you mean anywhere? So he runs to the field, and he goes right on his head. And I just happened to capture I took one shot. Story of every photographer's life, right? It's the last shot or one shot, and you get it, and you just pray. So anyway, so that's Romeo. So this is a Russian um, contortionist. And do you remember the image of Mary Ellen Mark? So one of the things that I think is actually a challenge, but I say you should take it on, which is that oftentimes you will see an image and you say to yourself, maybe, um, well, maybe I shouldn't take that because I've, somebody's done that. And what I would suggest to you is go for it because you will put your spin on it. It, it could be the way you photographed it. It could be um, where you were standing when you photographed it. So this was my um, image of uh, a con you know, this contortionist. And the thing about this particular contortionist is that I knew then what I know now, which is that she was just an incredible performer. And 10 years later, now she's with Cirque du Soleil, with uh, the, uh, the show Zumanity, which is the adult uh, circus. Um, the other thing, without generalizing too much about cultures, 
there were very big differences between the Russian performers, the Chinese performers, the South American performers. There were some differences in the way they approached their craft. The other thing that I saw a lot of when I was there was um, these are the hands of a 20-year-old. So that it's also very, very, um, it's pretty intense work. I mean, physically, it's very, very tough work. And so they want the calluses because that's how they're going to get through with their acts. Now, this one I, I titled um, Rings. And what was interesting about this young girl is that she was not allowed to wear makeup outside the circus. I mean, she was forbidden by her family because she was only, I think, 13 or 14 years old. So it was fascinating that when I would see her away from the circus, she was not in any kind of with any makeup or any, any lipstick. And her goal was to do, I think, 50. I don't know if you've ever seen these acts, but they can do 50 hula hoops, if not more. And they're heavy. Now, one of the things, um, and again, you know, Deborah, you may know, but what I learned in the circus is that oftentimes people in the circus start as, cir as clowns and they retire as clowns. So when they're babies, literally babies, they're all dressed up always, always. They make a little co baby costume for them and they put makeup on them and they make them into a little clown. And then oftentimes when they're two or three years old and they come on with their parents, they're always in a little clown outfit. And then fast forward, if they're not in as a clown, at the end of their career, not life, they, they also become clowns and they start performing. And this particular, they're both sisters. They were, not even, they were um, from the cookhouse. They were the children of the, of the people in the cookhouse. So if they wanted to perform, they could perform. This image is called, um, it's Ginger. And this was a really, a, a, there was a, there's a lot of takeaway from this because Ginger was um, one of the very few people in the circus that came by herself. Oftentimes in the circus world, they come as families or as duos, but this was, she came by herself. She was only 18 years old. She's from Canada. And she comes from a uh, family of circus performers. But she, so that was, for me, that was very unique because every time I would photograph, I would photograph series or couples. But she was by herself. She lived in this little tiny room in one of the trailers. And one of the things that she was working on was this aerial silk act. And she fell on her debut. She broke both arms. And so part of my experience of spending time with these people is I, of course, went to the hospital. And I you know, was with her. I met her mother. And it was pretty evident it was her mother because I've never seen such a sculpted person in my entire life. I mean, she was walking down the hallway. And I thought, oh, this must be her mother because she was a trapeze artist herself. I mean, a trapeze artist. She was an aerialist. And what, the thing that I thought was fascinating is for some reason I thought initially, um, this was going to be the end of her career. I thought, oh, well, this is it. And because that was pretty intense. I mean, you know, but luckily she was 18 years old and she's with Cirque du Soleil now. She performs. She's an aerialist. She's in incredible shape. Um, it didn't stop her, stop her. And so for me, this is, this is really teachable about, you know, these things do happen. And then you realize, as time went on, is that there are a lot of injuries. They just are. You know, they fall, they break. You'll see, I'll show you another image. But, you know, they, they, it's, they can really get hurt. So this was, to me, really, it's an important image. And one, it's a, that about, you know, that these things would happen. And she used to perform, so she put that on, um, the stars. And so... And I think, um, I'm almost sure that she still performed, but she would do walk-ins, you know, for the circus. Now, of course, 
being there 10 years, I started to see the performers have children, their babies. And so this performer, this is her first baby. Of course, now I, through, because of Facebook, I get to follow them. And so this baby now is 15 years old. And does not look like this, but, uh, and she has more children. But I wanted you to know that um, this was, you know, these are the moments. Like, like a lot of people who have children, they want to be photographed, and I wanted to do the same for them. So this is uh, an image I call Tiny Contortionist. And um, some people, I don't know what your, your reaction is, but um, she was really happy. That's a happy baby. If you turn it around and see her face, and she's with a little diaper. And one of the things that I thought was fascinating is that um, oftentimes they would like toss the children to each other pretty high. I mean, scary high, and it was to get them accustomed to heights. And so the other thing that they would do, and I've seen this, is they'll strap, not necessarily a, a toddler, but maybe three-year-old, on them, and then when they practice with a the net, they fly with them. Again, in an effort, and of course, guess what the kids want to do? They want to fly. They want to keep going and keep going and keep going. So. That was, and this is a, I call it tiny contortionist, even though she didn't become a contortionist, because they wanted her to become a contortionist, because being a contortionist is one of the safest things to do in the circus world. All right, so this was one of those decisive moments. It does happen in the photo world. Um, it was my last shot, I was walking away, it's time for me to go home. I just look back and I couldn't believe it, that, this, that she was behind the snake. But what was even better is that she yawned. And what, was, what I did is I showed it to her. I was a little nervous about showing this image to this woman. And she laughed and laughed and laughed. And she totally got it. Another person, probably like myself, would be a little bit embarrassed or maybe not, not like how I looked, but she totally got it, that that would be funny. Let me go back. By the way, if anybody lives in Queens and is near Queens, this particular uh, performer and his family are in a circus there near some civic center, maybe? That's it. That's it. So they're there now, because I asked them to come either today or tomorrow, and they can't because they're performing. So it's not their circus, but they're in a circus, and they're there. Now this one's called Smoke. And what's interesting is that when I would meet a lot of the people, they would all want to tell me the story of their lives. And they would say, oh, you have to meet him because, and then they would proceed to tell me their story of how famous he was. They used to call him, something a loco, you know, like it's always like that, some, some name, because he was known in Brazil as flying the highest possible point of the tent. And so now he's a clown, because he doesn't do it anymore. And he's also trying to always quit smoking. So that's why I thought this was very telling. This one, um, again, is one of those, I'm leaving, it's dark, I'm thinking, hell no, I'm not going to get this image, but let me try to shoot it anyway. Even when I got the contact sheet, I found myself looking at the contact sheet and thinking, oh, I don't see it. But, but when it came to the magic of the dark room, the detail was there. So um, again, I shot this once. And that particular metal um, structure is actually pretty heavy. This was, um, again, by being there as long as I was, I would hear stories, and some, sometimes it would allow me to come up with some ideas, possibly. But one of the things about this boy, he was three years old, was 
he didn't speak English. Um, he only spoke Mandarin. And so, but he learned some words in Spanish. So oftentimes they would either speak Spanish or some words in Mandarin or some words in Russian. But it was never English. I actually am bilingual, I speak Spanish. So then I would speak to them and then they would say, oh, you should see Mumu. He does Popeye. And I thought, how can a little three-year-old Chinese boy do an imitation of Popeye? I thought he was going to go to his trailer, get whatever, get up, and look like Popeye. And so when I saw him, I said, um, um, I said something like, you know, I might have said Popeye. And he pulls out, right, right there. And everything about him was just perfection. I get on the floor, I think I sat on the floor in the dirt, and I photographed him. And that's the story of that one. So to me, these are like gifts, and those are moments. And it also, would it, I'm, you know, the other thing that is a, a good takeaway is that part of creating an image is also being there and hearing their stories and seeing, as opposed to telling them, do Popeye now, and setting it up, and having the lights. And in my case, that's not how I roll. I, that's not how I do it. So it was about composing the image. The other thing is that the way I shoot, I shoot full frame. I never take anything out. I have really taught myself, um, you know, and I'm very disciplined about full frame, doing it in my viewfinder. I just, and even if I shoot digital, which I rarely do, but if, when I do, I try to do it like that so that I don't do it, in, you know, in the dark room and I don't start cutting things out. I think that's an issue of, for me, an issue of training, it's an issue of seeing, and it's an issue of discipline. This is where I just took a deep breath and I shot it because there was no light. But you know what's great about Tri-X? It's pretty forgiving. It's got a big range and the darks are really beautiful. So um, this is something that came out. This is in the back of the book. So if you see the book, the book has that image. Now one of the things is they all have pets. And they're like everybody else. The pets are like people, and they love them. And um, this woman is a Russian uh, quick change artist, and she can take that off in seconds. I mean, before your eyes, she's like in some little skimpy thing. And she comes from a family of um, quick change artists. So again, you find out that they all have, um, um, you know, they, they either come from generations of a particular act and then they bring that act with them. Okay, so back to pets. So um, this was, um, they all have pets and they all have three or four of them and they have birds and, but they're not part of the act. They're just with their pets and that's something that I um, had wanted to photograph. Again, you can see that I shoot full frame I pretty I love elements in a particular image I'm one of these like people that likes things in it I'm also a major collector if anybody knows me I have a lot of stuff so anyway so that's the other I'm almost to the end um, okay so so this is um, an announcement to the to the book and also um, the cover of the book except it's uh, Italian linen and we can talk a little bit about the book process, but the book was, this cover made me super uncomfortable. It was about me letting go because it wasn't exactly what I was thinking. And oftentimes it happens to all of us. We have this idea in our head and then we stick with it. And then when you get an introduction to another idea, it's really unsettling. And so I, um, I found myself, um, I'll go back a little bit. So I found myself that the, this, this particular circus ended. And when it ended, it ended because there were many reasons. Well, the primary reason was immigration. 
as you know, like in 2008, um, there was this big change in the immigration law. So it was getting harder and harder and harder to get people to come and get their documents to perform. And a lot of voice circus is really the, at the ultimate melting pot. But it was getting to the point where they couldn't get the performers to come. And so he folded. And for me, I thought I would fold the project as well, which is where I ended the project then. To end, um, but, for, but, I can, but I continue to be in touch with them, thank you very much, via Facebook. The other thing that was interesting is it'll tell you the time change is that I used to follow them because I would get a route sheet from them and literally in the mail. And so they would send it to me and then I would be so excited. I'd get a map in my studio, I'd line it up and I'd figure out where they were. And so, for example, one of the places that they would go to um, would be what they call the prison route. And the prison route was Folsom. It was all the places where all the prisons were. And primarily because it was cheaper to do the circuses there. Because one of the things that's the issue for circuses is where to perform and the cost of that. And in a big city, I think Big Apple has a permanent house. Is that correct? Do they have a, Deborah, do you know? Right. So they have a permanent, but whereas when you have traveling circuses, they have to go ahead, they have to secure the site and then they have to perform. And one of the things is the cost. So somebody had asked me if our circuses are dead, and they're not necessarily, I don't think there's as many, but they're not, but they're always in rural America. They're not in the cities because it's too expensive in the cities. So I would go and I would find out within 100 miles, I would go see them. And if they were a little bit too far, then I'd spend the night. Almost came close to getting an RV. I still may. but. I would go because they would say, you know, hook, I could, you know, I would have access to it. The other thing that I found out is that when I was in the circus, there were people who actually did this for a living. People who were retired, who loved circuses, and they would just say, well, can we just join you and help you out? There's also a religious order of nuns who actually, actually work uh, for circuses, a particular order. So I got to meet them as well. So... It was pretty fascinating, kind of the different people. But anyway, back to the cover. One of the things that I um, did with this incredible designer, her name is Yolanda Cuomo, is that she designed the cover of, she designed my book. And she has done uh, Richard Avedon's uh, books, uh, Diane Arbus's books, uh, Dune Arbus, um, Kenneth Cole's books. I mean, all the different, the great, you know, a lot of great creative people. And she's out of New York. And um, she was, we were able to secure a publisher, so the book was published in Italy. And I went to Italy this summer, and I published a book there. I had a, a publisher did it. And um, so we can talk a little bit about that. So I just wanted to show you a quick um, view of what would happen. One of the things that I realized is that because I still use film, I still have contact sheets, I still use the dark room, that I thought that the natural thing is that I really wanted to have a, a, a crafted book. I wanted it to be the best it could be. And I wanted the photographs to look like a photograph. So this is one of the reasons why I decided to go with this Italian publisher. And I, I don't know if you can see just this, tick, this meter. It reads the duotones. It reads the scale of the dark and the white. And so for every image, uh, I had to okay it. Just wanted you to know that. And then this was the process of looking at the cover, which was the only thing that had color. It's my cover. Everything else is black and white. And the idea, again, is that the cover would be a poster. Because, as you know, when you see a circus, you always see the, the poster first. What I loved was choosing everything about the book. And so this is part of how the book is sewn. And the book was sewn in another part of Italy. These are just some of the snapshots from there. I don't know why I was surprised. I had no idea the level of of the printing process. It was very, it was fascinating for me.
And then um, I wanted to, this is the end of the presentation, but I wanted to share with you three books that I really would highly recommend. The first one is Wabi Sabi. Does anybody know Wabi Sabi? Um, I think, Antonio, you would know, but a Wabi Sabi is um, a Japanese concept. Um, and what I love about it is that it's basically that imperfection in itself is beautiful. And for someone like me that still uses film, and I don't tweak it, I don't fix it, I really, really relate to that. Because I think even when an image is not quite perfect, it can be beautiful. And if you stay with that concept, it really will, you'll, you will see it through in your work. So it's this really amazing small book that you should have and you should reference because it really, it just takes you right back to what you're doing. Of course, the other is On Photography by Susan Sontag. Who was, a, who was a great writer, and, um, and she was really ahead of her time. So I recommend that book as well. And then the other is a new book that came out. It's called Publish Your Photography Book. His name is Darius um, Hines and Virginia Swanson. And it's basically a how-to book, how to do a book. And it's pretty thorough. I mean, it gives you step by step pretty much gives you a punch list, which is kind of nice, so that you don't have to necessarily research at all. But that actually is a really great book that I, you know, I used, I actually, I, you know, I, I used it, I referenced it, I still feel, and I'll tell you, that there is no such thing as one way of doing a book. You can ask me anything you want, but there isn't one way. Darn it, I thought I'd find that. I thought I'd speak to somebody, but it's kind of like making wine. You know, when you talk to a winemaker, or you talk to somebody who's a chef and you say, so tell me, how do you do that? And then you ask some questions and they can give you the ingredients, but you still don't know how to do it until you do it. So while I read that book, it, it still, I still did it a little differently, of course. So, but I wanted to share because I remember when I would hear lectures, you know, some takeaways and one of them were, you know, what do you like to read? And I think that if you had these three and you were thinking of publishing your work or not necessarily in a book, um, you know, I think that you will find this pretty helpful. And as they say, right, Deborah? May all your days be circus days. That's right. May all your days be circus days, which is how they end. All right. Thank you. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, BNH has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.